So I've shared with you guys a little bit before about my younger days and, and some of the challenges that I faced. I told you that I was a difficult teen, and that's putting it mildly. I shared with you that I, I was sent away from home to different behavioral treatment facilities, uh, two of them, and one of them kicked me out twice. Luckily, the third time, it stuck. I tell you all that to say this. I, I remember when I was sent away the third time. I was convinced that my dad didn't want me anymore. We had been in this kind of uh, intense struggle for years, and I thought that he had finally given up on me, which is what I thought I wanted until I was sent away. In actuality, my dad was doing what was best for me at a very great price and at a very great emotional cost. The accusations from me were many but also at a great financial cost. And when I share this part of my testimony, this is the part that I never talk about because I don't, want any, I don't want to make anyone feel bad about their current circumstances or make me look like a bigger jerk than I already do. And I only realized this because I worked at a behavioral treatment facility for 17 years. Otherwise, I may have never realized this. And certainly, this is a, a price that I could never repay nor would I be expected to. It costs anywhere from $250 to $500 a day in those places. I was in there for a long time. I didn't find this out until I was ready for college, uh, but my dad had set aside college money for us. He planned ahead so that we didn't have to go through the, the financial strain of student loans. Well, let's just say that my college money was well good and gone before I even made it through high school. I told you already in this series that I felt like God called me into ministry as I came out of high school. I felt a calling now at this point in my, t in my life to go to Bible college, and we don't have time to get into it here this morning, but, but trust me, it's a fascinating story and testimony to see how God was, was moving all the pieces of the puzzle and putting them into place so that I could end up where I, where I am now. I still remember the night where I went into Dad's room after I'd finally struggled to get my high school diploma. Uh, I didn't get to walk with everyone. I had to graduate in summer school. Um, but I remember my brother had come home from KCC, and he's talking to me about college and talked me into going. And I, I remember I walked into uh, my Dad's room. Now, remember, remember what I said about the college money. I walked in, and I said, um, Dad, so I think I want to go to KCC. Uh, that's the K Kentucky Christian College uh, with, with Jeff. So I said, I want to I go to college. And he, and he looked at me and he said, David, you know you can't make it. Now, before you say anything there, I struggled in school. I, I don't learn like everybody else. Uh, I'm a very visual person. I need to be able to, like, see it. So I struggled. And college... <laughs> Would, would have been near impossible. Near impossible, not impossible. But Dad said, you know you can't make it. But I said back to Dad, I said, I know, but I still want to try. Remember what I said about the money. He didn't even bring it up. He said, okay, sign up for your ACTs and apply to college, and let's just see what happens. Now, <laughs> I went and took my ACTs in Tampa. I sat down. I did the best I could. But to be perfectly honest with you, once I hit the math section, I just completely christmas tree the rest of it. Because everyone else is walking up there, turning their tests in, and I didn't want to look like the dummy that's still sitting there, can't figure out what I'm doing. And there was also a time limit. So I just christmas tree the whole, the, the whole rest of it and still somehow got a high enough score for the school to let me in on academic probation. Now, like I said, I, I, as an adult, I can, I can look back now and I can see it so clearly. And I told you all of that to say this. Throughout all of that, those struggling years, I, I didn't understand. I didn't think my dad loved me. I didn't think God could still love me. But in truth, they were both doing what fathers do. Sometimes the best way that you can show you care is to allow mistakes and room for growth. Allow failure, but be there when you're needed. So the question is not, does God care? But will you recognize and desire his care when it comes? God's care is not just seen when he, he rescues you from the storm. The storm is his care. 
Sometimes you need the storm to see God's glory because he is zealous to rescue you from you. He wants to rescue you from you, yourself. God's care can sometimes be violent. He, he rips you from what is dangerous to give you what is better. God will oftentimes bring us to the end of ourselves so that we will turn and face him again. He does this ultimately to bring us back to him and his purpose and plan for our lives. And this is a lesson that Jonah was in the process of learning and one that we're learning from his story. So Jonah ran from God. He got thrown overboard, swallowed by a fish, and then puked up on land. And Jonah was out of the storm now. He's, he's out of the fish, but he's not yet out of God's school of learning. Let's take a look at chapter 3. Jonah 3, 1 through 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, before we go any further, I want to stop here because this has to be one of the most amazing and, and hope-filled verses in the entire Bible. Listen to those, those first few words one more time. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now, those words don't seem, they may not seem like much. But when you consider all that happened uh, in the first two chapters of this book, Jonah's absolute and, and defiant rebellion against and rejection of God's purposes and plans, these words are, are dripping with grace. They smell of grace and they, they taste of grace. Unmerited and undeserved favor. Normally, no one likes to hear the word second. To come in second is nothing more than holding the title of first place loser. No one ever sets out to be runner-up in anything. Anyone who plays sports will tell you that you don't, you don't start a game or a match hoping to lose. Did anyone in here ever like when they were little to, to hear, or still like, uh, to hear those words, hold on just a second. I'll get that for you in just a second. Second is simply not a word that any of us wants to hear unless it's used in this way. I'm giving you a second chance. For those of us who've blown it at some point in our, in our life, uh, those, that, that word second is a, is a tremendous word of grace. You've blown it with your girlfriend. You know, maybe you missed the, the third week of the anniversary, the first time you saw her wear a blue sweater. <laughs> I'll give you a second chance. <laughs> you've blown it with your wife. You remembered the first day of deer season, but you forgot her birthday. <laughs> I'll give you a second chance. <laughs> You've blown it with your children. I'll give you a second chance, Dad. Uh, you've blown it with your boss. I'm going to give you a second chance. You've blown it with God. I will give you a second chance. Those words, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, are sweet words. They are precious words. They're priceless words. Everyone deserves a second chance. We're, we're, we're fond of that saying, aren't we? It sounds good, but it's not true. We don't deserve a second chance. We get a first chance, and if we, we blow it, or we waste it, or we walk away, then we get what is called justice. To have a second chance is nothing short of grace. Let's go back to those verses, uh, Jonah 3, 1 through 2. The word of the, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, I want you to notice that Jonah is given a second chance, but God hasn't changed. God's plan has not changed. God's design and desire for Jonah's life hasn't changed one bit. God brought Jonah to the end of himself so that he would once again turn and face God. And again, God issues the same call. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And I want you to understand that the purpose of the storm is not to change our circumstances. And it's definitely not to change God, but to change us. We find that, that something is changing in this story. Jonah. God's not just going to do a work in the city of Nineveh. God is also doing a work inside of Jonah. And if you haven't noticed, the first few verses of, of chapter 3 and chapter 1 are, are eerily similar. There are very few differences, but the differences are there, and they make all the difference in the world. Listen to this, Jonah 1, 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, of son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. 
But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. All right, now listen to Jonah 3, 1 through 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. The first time God's word came, the first word describing Jonah's response is the word but. That's usually not a good word. I, I was going to do this for you, but I, I don't have time. I, I was, I was going to go to the beach for vacation this year, but a hurricane hit. I was going to give you the job, but you didn't meet all the qualifications. I, I think you get the picture. Now, now in verse 3 of chapter 3, after God's word comes a second time, we, see, we find a different word altogether. The word obeyed. God calls us to obedience in some area of our spiritual walk. And we say, God, you know, that sounds like a great idea, but I know that you're calling me to give my life to you and, and get saved, but I know you're calling me to make my faith public and be baptized, but I know you're calling me to be faithful and giving a tithe to the church, but... Jonah is learning a lesson that we need to learn. And, and that lesson is obedience brings blessing. And disobedience invites burden and correction. When God speaks, we, we should have only one response. Yes, Lord. Because Jonah obeyed God, obeyed God, he had the privilege of seeing God do an unbelievable spiritual miracle. In the most unlikely of cities, and in the most unwilling of hearts, and the most ungodly of people, the, the Assyrians, the dreaded Ninevites, at the heart of this book, we find God's heart. A heart for missions, a heart for evangelism, a heart to see people repent of their sin and come to faith in Christ. While we can apply Jonah's disobedience to any area of our life, it really was the disobedience related to the missionary mandate that God had placed on Jonah. And not simply on Jonah, but on the entire nation of Israel. And the missionary mandate that he's given to his church. Jonah was unwilling to sound the alarm and extend a warning to these ungodly people in Nineveh. He knew that a warning was an offer of grace. He knew that a warning of judgment to come was also an opportunity to repent. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 8, If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. Jonah was not concerned about those outside of his nation. He wasn't concerned about those who were on the outside of God's uh, covenant with his people. He, he wasn't concerned about those who did not know God and were far from God. Jonah was once again face to face with God, and, he, and, and as he turns to God once again, he sees something that, that, that is repeated in, in so many different ways throughout the whole Bible, and that is, is love and concern for all people and a desire to see them come to faith in him. Jonah may not have been concerned about the spiritual condition and salvations of the nation, but God was. He still is. We may not be concerned about the, the spiritual condition and salvation of others, but God is. Jonah may not have thought the people of Nineveh were worth the effort and grace, but God did. He still does. We may not think people are worth the effort and resources and grace, but God does. Who are the Ninevites in our day? Some of them are in this room. Some of them are in your neighborhood. Some of them work with you. Some of them are your children, parents, friends, family. They are the people who are far from God. Nineveh and the people of Nineveh make Vegas look like Disneyland. They are the people that are they're just too messed up and too far gone, too washed up and too damaged in our eyes to ever be saved. They are the people that we say are hopeless, difficult and too hard-hearted and to ever respond to a message of grace. No one, and I mean no one, is too far gone. 
There is no one so low that God cannot reach them. There is no one so cemented in their sin that God cannot pull them out. There's no one too damaged that God cannot make them new. There's no heart so hard that God cannot break through. There's no one so fast that they can outrun the, the line of God that pursues their soul. They need to hear. They need to be told. They need people who are willing to speak. They need people who are willing to go. They need people who are willing to step out of their comfort zones and, and, and cross cultural, uh, racial, national, social, political, and economic lines and geographical lines to bring them the gospel. Romans 10, 14, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Our call is the same as Jonah. Preach the gospel, call people to repentance, give, call people to God by giving them the good news, the word of God. Like Jonah, we've been called to the nations. We've, we've been called to take the gospel across the street and around the world. So Jonah went. Jonah 3, 3 through 10. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne. He took off his, his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation the, that the king of Nineveh issued. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had planned. That's absolutely amazing. It's nothing short of miraculous. As some would say, it's a, a God thing. Think about it. I mean, you have a, a reluctant and somewhat unwilling prophet going into the most wicked and vile city of his day with a very simple but pointed message. Repent. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. It's not a politically correct message. It didn't take into account how sensitive some might be. It was, as we like to say, it is what it is. A call to recognize that what they're doing, that, that the direction that they're headed is wrong, and it will end up in absolute destruction. We've somehow developed the attitude that to tell someone that they need to give their life to Jesus or they're going to spend eternity in hell is not a message to stir the hearts to faith, but rather it's a message to fan the flames of anger and, and that we're wrong for saying it. No. The world has to hear the bad news before it's ever ready to hear the good news. That is something that I want everybody who can hear this interview to know. As much as I'm supposed to be promoting this movie, talking about my album, I just feel like we're in competition right now because they are trying to normalize the devil. They are trying to pop, they, the devil is, is on the main stage at award shows and in every video and yeah, signs and symbols. And I said, you know what? We need to stop treating our relationship with Jesus like the little buddy that you talk to before you go to bed at night and not be more vocal about all the things that God means to us and all of the things that God has brought us through. Because there's been a lot of moments that you didn't post about. Mm -hmm. But yet you know, how did God decide to get me through this? Yeah, and 
Yeah, they going above and beyond to promote the devil. What's going on? How is it that Hollyweird is talking about the God and, uh, that we love and come here every week to worship, but we remain silent? What's going on? Someone has to stand and say, I am not okay, and you are not okay, and everything is not going to be okay. We need to turn from our sin and turn from ourselves and turn to God and fall on His mercy and find grace and salvation. It was the message God gave to the prophets, the message that Jesus came to give us. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. I don't really know how enthusiastic Jonah was about this message. I mean, he was only supposed to say what God told him to. I can't imagine that he had to say much more. And I mean, I can just picture Jonah now on a, on a street corner with one of those sandwich board signs, you know, that hang around your neck and, it, you know, a board on each side with these letters scrawled out on it, you know, like the end is near, with his hair bleached white and just sticking up everywhere, his dark Middle Eastern faded skin. He's got white splotches all over him from the acid from the whale's stomach with this crazy look in his eyes saying, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. You know, I could just see people coming up to him and going, dude, what happened to you? Well, God told me to come here and preach, and, and, and I didn't really want to because I don't really like you guys a whole lot. So I ran. I got hopped on a ship, and then I got thrown overboard, and then I got eaten by a fish, and so it puked me up, and so here I am. Forty more days, and then it will be overthrown. <laughs> Well, the word spread all the way to the palace and the king. And we don't know if Jonah got an audience with the king, but according to some of the traditions and customs of the day that I've read anyway, I believe there's a good chance that Jonah, at the very least, was able to declare his message personally to some high-ranking officials, and quite possibly the king himself. Just a simple message, message and the miraculous happened. A citywide revival started. Revival always starts with people confessing and repenting and humbling themselves before God. This happened from the, from the palace to the pool hall. Even the animals were dressed up to show the repentant hearts and, and prayers for mercy. Did you notice that once Jonah delivered the message, because he was faithful, because he was obedient, the focus of the story shifts to what God does and to the people who heard. The same is true for us when we share. We're called to obedience. We're called to go. We're called to, to share. And once we've done that, God will do the rest. In truth, God had already been working and preparing uh, the hearts of these people through military struggles. You can see that in 2 Kings. God, God had already prepped their hearts to hear Jonah's message. And they, all they needed was someone to come and speak the word of God to them. And what's amazing is that, excuse me, once again, we, we, in the story, we find God to be a gracious God, the God of second chances. When, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented. He relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he didn't do it. God does not rejoice in the destruction of the wicked. He's glorified in all he does, but he, he doesn't rejoice when people perish. God is patient towards us, not desiring any one of us to perish, but for all of us to come to faith in him. I want you to see something in this passage today. God's great love for people, for those who belong to him and are, are being disobedient, and maybe they're running, who've blown it, for those who have thrown their testimony away. They traded the glory of God for the ugliness and emptiness of the world. And for those who don't know God, He is a God of second chances or third or maybe fourth. Or maybe if you're like me, you've lost count. He is the God of grace. I want to let you know that if, if you don't walk out of here with anything else this morning, He is the God of second, third, fourth, fifth, and fiftieth chances, but he is not the God of an infinite chance. His spirit will not always strive with man. 
The opportunity, the window for repentance is open, but it will not be open forever. If you tell God no long enough, you will no longer hear his voice. If you guys are, if you're here today and uh, you, I don't know, maybe you've been running like Jonah. Maybe you've been telling God no. Maybe today's the day that you tell him yes. We're not always going to get things right. Jonah didn't get it right. God gave him another chance. God, give, God is giving you a chance right now to make that decision to begin living your life for him. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Dear God, we come before you now to, Lord, to seek your will for our lives. Lord, there are many of us in this room that are being called in, in different areas of service. That you're trying to do a work in their lives. And I just pray that, that you would help those people to see that perhaps the storm that they're in right now is you. that you are preparing them, strengthening them for what you're calling them to. And I just pray, Lord, that they would be open and respond to um, the calling that you're putting on them. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.